So with that, we have a wonderful guest speaker with us here today. His name is Tony Chimera, and he is the Chief Talent Officer at Westfield Specialty. So Tony, I'll hand it over to you uh, to perhaps tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Tandeka. Um, really cool to be here. Uh, so early in my career, uh, you'll find that I like to tell stories. Um, we were doing mergers and acquisitions, and I was the person who always had to come on right after lunch. So the fact that you're here right before a holiday weekend, I feel like is like I'm completing the circle of life. So number one, I appreciate you taking the time. And number two, to Tandeka's comment, this is going to be um, a chill. I consider it a conversation. So I'll have time at the end for questions. I'm happy to take questions as we go. If you don't want to go on camera, type them into the chat box, whatever is useful. Um, so the title of the session is Brand and Career Management. Um, I'm a big movie fan, and it's a bit of a dated movie now, but uh, Field of Dreams is the movie that, that the quote is from, which is, if you build it, they will come, which I think is very analogous to your career and your brand. Um, and you will find in this industry, the greatest thing is um, you have heard probably a thousand times it's a relationship industry. Um, and really, we don't make anything. It's about our relationships. It's about the talent. Um, and it's about curiosity, in my opinion. So we'll, we'll come back to that as we go through the presentation. And let me see if this will work. There we yeah, go. It's okay. working. So... Um, I, um, we have a bunch of interns here at Westfield Specialty. So uh, the first presentation we did, I was like, every presentation is going to have a career path portion of the program. Um, and I use this for my president. And he goes, my career path was like all planned out. It's not a big winding road. Um, I think in reality, everyone's career path is a bit of a winding road. So I thought I'd lead with kind of how I got here. Um, and number one, I'm so appreciative that all of you are here because you're, you're being intentional about insurance as an industry. I was not. Um, I ended. I was like a lot of people. Uh, I started in technology, always in HR, by the way. Um, when I started at the first company, they'd never had an HR department. The executive assistant was doing all the HR work. She handed me a stack of resumes like that. And that was very formative to me because I had to figure it out. And I've, I've found the places that I've enjoyed working is places where I've had to figure it out. Um, you know, for me, big companies that have kind of really defined swim lanes, it just, it doesn't work for me personally. And that's what I'd encourage you to think about with your career is where do your passions lie and find that alignment. Um, and particularly with the culture of the company, that's the biggest takeaway that I've had in my career is when I've been happy, it's been when the company and I have been in almost complete alignment, always doesn't work that way. You have to take bumps in the road. Um, but anyway, so I started in that technology company, went to publishing, went back to technology, ended up at a company called MetLife, my one big company experience, um, liked a lot of it, didn't like being told, hey, don't talk to people who aren't your clients, don't do things outside of your job description. So I went back to technology, um, then ended up at a company called Axis Capital, which was a specialty company that, that is uh, celebrated 20 years. Um, was there about, gosh, probably almost uh, eight years and then or eight and a half years and then went to a company called Endurance, which was bought by Sampo, was there almost um, eight years as well, and then came to Westfield Specialty as head of talent. Um, and I have responsibility for kind of HR talent, uh, marketing. And when I came in, they gave me facilities, which was not the gift that keeps on giving, but somebody needed to do it. So I did it. Um, so that's a little bit about my career. Um, again, this is just a summary. I'm based in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. Um, you know, I've, to follow your passions comment that I made earlier, um, something that I've always been interested in is emerging talent and in, in diversity in this industry. You know, and I, I'm not going to like beat up the industry too bad, but I will take a couple free shots. Um, look at the board of directors, look at the management teams across this industry. We are in dire need of more diversity. Um, and I think I say that, and in the last five years, I've seen more intentional acts around that than in the previous 20 years before that. So I think there is a bright future. 
Um, you know, as all of you logged on, I, it didn't, it wasn't lost on me that we have a lot of diversity in this room and that's happening more and more. But I think the key is it's not just check the box actions. It has to be meaningful, thoughtful, intentional. Um, and it's not done in a day. It's part of your culture and it's how you behave with customers, employees, competitors, et cetera. Um, so I've been involved in WSIA, which is an association that's focused on the wholesale insurance industry. Been on the internship committee 15 years, um, was named to the Diversity Foundation last year. Um, and I also didn't even put on here, I'm also the head of the Diversity Internship Committee with WSIA. So I've, I've found a lot of um, like minds there as well as with Spencer and Tandeka and I have known each other a long time. Um, I'm also part of an association called the Multicultural Reinsurance and Insurance Association, which started last year. Um, and last but not least, I'm from Buffalo, so all Buffalo sports make me happy, uh, except when they lose. All right. So I'm going to shift a little bit. And like I said, I'll pause through here as we go. Um, but I thought I'd start with brand. So I remember, you know, probably well before you guys were in university, the, the topic of brand management came up and it was kind of a LinkedIn phenomenon. And it went something like, hey, um, I would love to improve your brand. I'll give you a headshot. And then we can kind of redesign your LinkedIn page. So it was, you know, it was the start of this discussion around people could have brands. I think historically when people thought of brands and I'm a big geek, I will admit that as well. I think of something like Marvel, um, which I, I can define very clearly what Marvel's trying to do. Um, I think it's not that different for people, but it is a little bit different. Again, personal brands are in our control. You know, corporate brands are a little bit less authentic, a little bit more marketing oriented. Um, I think personal brands are more flexible too. And last but not least, I have yet to see this, but I'm sure it's coming. I haven't seen anyone with their personalized logo. You know, maybe you use your initials in some way or a signature, um, but it is a little bit different. Same concept though. Um, again, the things that I think of are, it's got to be authentic. And I will tell you, you know, that first HR job I had, I didn't have any clue what my brand was. I just did stuff. Um, and then I think as you get more and more experience, that gets more and more established. I think the, the neat thing for all of you early in your career and where we are is, I think you can be more intentional about it. For most of us, we've kind of stumbled in it. And that's okay. But I think, you know, I know underwriters at our shop who have, you know, five or six years of experience, and I can kind of understand what their brand is. And really all a brand is, is who you are and what differentiates you. So if you're not comfortable with the concept, focus on that. Um, and it's gonna evolve and it's gonna develop. But again, go back to the first bullet, it has to be authentic. So like if, if you are a complete and utter introvert, it's unlikely that you're going to, you know, you're going to start doing Tony Robbins speeches um, because it's just not your comfort zone, but you can develop on that spectrum. So don't, you know, don't surrender um, what you want your brand to be. Just recognize that it's got to be authentic. Does that make sense? Okay. And I'm going to pause. This is going to be my first pause point. So I'm going to open it up and any questions? And I love the uh, the Iron Man pin. Uh, yeah, I have a Captain America pin on my backpack. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, so I'm just going to, I see most of you on screen. Anyone heard of a personal brand or a personal board of directors before? Just raise your hand. No one? That's good. I love when I'm bringing this. I'll, uh, I'll get your email addresses. I'll send you a really cool Harvard Business Review article on this that kind of lays it out. But basically, this is a fancy word for your people. Um, it, and what I'd say is early in your career, it's probably going to be stacked toward family and friends. And that's totally okay. Um, they will, you'll always have family and friends on your board of directors. But the notion behind it is like when I think of my career in that winding road that I showed you, when I have made mistakes, 
it's been when I didn't ask anyone about a decision that I wasn't entirely sure about. And that's all that a personal board of directors is. It's people that you trust, that'll give you advice and, and challenge you a little bit. So it can't just be your best friends who's, you know, who's always kind of rooting for you, um, who's not gonna tell you the truth. Um, you want it to be broad and you want them to really ultimately help brainstorm ideas. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example, um, the MetLife thing, which again, I'll, I, I loved MetLife in a lot of ways, but I should have known better um, than do that. And I only did it for like two years and some change because I quickly figured out, okay, this isn't going to work for me. One of my friends about a year in, he's like, so how's it going? And I said, you know, it's going okay, but you know, this is a little frustrating. This is a little frustrating. He's like, why didn't you like talk to me about this because I would have been the first person to tell you that's not what you want to do. Um, that's what a personal board of directors does. Again, they go, okay, I know this looks like everything you want, but have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? Um, and you know, the other thing that I would encourage you to do is, is, is you build this group of people. And by the way, you don't have to like freak them out and tell them that they're on your board of directors. Um, I actually do that now. Uh, because I'm comfortable enough to, to do that. And the one guy's like, oh, is it a board of director meeting again? Is that why you're calling me? Or did you just call and say hi? Um, but you can just say, hey, I, you know, I want to be able to bounce some things off of you um, and, and get an honest opinion. And you'll know who those people are is, you know, again, as you, as you kind of build your career, you want some of them from personal life, maybe a couple from the company you're in, but I wouldn't make it too many because again, they're gonna have a view of kind of what you're focusing on that might be similar to you and some from other places. And again, it can be, it should be a variety. It should be diverse. Um, you know, again, going back to DE and I, that's where we get our best ideas. It's from different points of views, different spectrums. Um, second, again, I think open to providing challenging, differing opinions. And it should be reciprocal. If you're always going to this one person for advice, you know, again, if they're super senior in their career and you're not, it, it'll start that way. But over time, it'll equalize. Again, it should be it should be two way. And I think it's just a great way to again vet ideas because when you're you know when you're in the middle of something, you're in the middle of it, so you don't see the forest from the trees. This is the group that helps you see that. Um, are all of you, are all of you guys on LinkedIn? Just raise your hand if you're on LinkedIn. I, I assume so. If you're not, get on there. Um, uh, you know, I think LinkedIn is a great way. Number one, early in your career to gather information. I use it as a news feed. So, you know, again, presumably you're all interested in, in the industry, go to every single company you can think of and follow them. Um, you know, if you're looking to make a move at a company, to a company, find people that are in that company and link with them. Nowadays, I think most people, if you write a kind of customized note, they're going to they're gonna link with you. They're, you know, it's not the old, well, if I don't know you, I'm not going to. Again, if the only time I don't accept an invitation is when somebody like has joined LinkedIn last week and they have two connections. And I'm like, mm, this might be something that's not um, useful to me. But other than that, I'll always accept a LinkedIn request and I'd encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I'm your kind of HR person for life now. You've endured you know, enough of this. So you, you get to use me for advice um, or counsel. That's the best thing that I get to do. But I'd say use LinkedIn to network. Um, and it can be simple stuff um, like you know, if somebody posts something or likes something, you can comment on top of it. You can like it. My, my caution is with both comments and likes, if you're going to do that, make sure you read what you're liking or commenting on because it can, the article can be titled, you know, I love the color blue and the text could be blue is the worst color in the world. I don't like it. I, you know, it's garbage. So, you know, be cautious about what you like, but, you know, nowadays, most of what's posted on LinkedIn is pretty easily edible. So you're not reading War and Peace. You're usually reading about six paragraphs. Just make sure you read it. If you comment on something, you know, again, make sure it's, you know, number one, it's authentic. And number two, 
It's, um, you know, again, LinkedIn is, has been good at this largely. It doesn't stray into, you know, kind of personal opinion. It's, it's related to, you know, what you're reading and it's not something that would be viewed as controversial. If you feel even queasy about it, don't post on it or don't like it. Um, and I think the final frontier, which is happening more and more now is just putting up your own content and your own content. Again, it doesn't need to be war and peace. It can be something as two or three paragraphs. Um, but again, it's a good way to accentuate what you're passionate about. Um, things that you want people to know about you. And again, just project that brand out. Um, you know, other social media, I would say is a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, some, some folks are using, and I can think of some people right now, I just saw some stuff like TikTok in really cool ways um, and to make, you know, to make it kind of fun and take, you know, what you could do on LinkedIn and take it to another level. I think that's something that we'll see more of, um, you know, um, some companies you have Instagram accounts and Twitter accounts, which, you know, I didn't even know Twitter was still around kind of, but um, you, you can use that as well. What I'd say is the nice thing about LinkedIn is it's kind of carved out that it is a business oriented um, social media function. Some of these other things are not, and it can drift into areas um, they'll all evolve. I think ultimately what you want to do is number one, use it initially as a networking tool, then use it to accentuate your brand. And then as you build your career, thought leadership, I mean, we're, we were talking today, I was talking to my marketing person about kind of what specialty Westfield specialty is doing. And really what we want to do with social media is really use it to, to do thought leadership. Um, and, you know, I think you can do that individually as well. So it is a great tool, both to gather information and to send information about yourselves. And I'm going to pause again. Any, any questions or anything that I can touch on there? Okay. I'm going to keep going then. Um, so I mentioned I've been in HR my entire career. So this is where I'll get a little bit on my soapbox um, and I'll, t I'll tell some stories too. What I would say about brands is they take a long time to develop. Um, they don't take that long to damage. Um, a couple of minutes might be a little bit dramatic, but it's certainly possible and I've seen it. Um, so the things that I would tell you are just be real protective uh, of your brand. Um, I think once upon a time, when when news didn't travel so fast, people could make little mistakes, and that's all that they were. Now, because of the way the world operates, is you can make a little mistake and everyone knows about it by the end of that day. So don't freak out about it. Um, what I would say is, the insurance industry is super fun. It, actually, I wish we could find some way to really let people know that because you say that at a party and it's a quick way to, to clear the room. By the way, the only worst thing is when somebody goes, what do you do in insurance? And you say, oh, I'm in HR. And people are like, well, at least he's not a lawyer. Um, so, but the insurance industry is fun. Um, hopefully all of you have experienced that, um, but it's also work. So I would say, you know, and again, um, I say this in a group of executives and, and I'll get a little bit of a mixed reaction. I think I'll, if I say this to you, I won't get a mixed reaction. The workplace follows you, period. If you're, you know, certainly when you're in the office, um, but, you know, every kind of interesting or, or challenging situation I've faced from an HR standpoint generally doesn't happen in the office. It happens in a bar between the hours of 10 and 2 a.m. and maybe after 2 a.m. in some cases. Um, and I'd say one of the common threads is generally there's alcohol involved, which look, if you drink, that's okay. If you don't drink, that's okay. And I think that's become, people used to worry about that second bit. I think that's become more acceptable. Um, but what I would say is just be cognizant of it. This industry likes to socialize. 
And when you socialize, it's usually at a restaurant or a bar and just be thoughtful about it and don't presume because somebody has a super senior title that they have any sense at all. Because again, most of the situations that I, or most of the examples that I'll tell you would not be the, the most junior people in the organization behaving badly. Usually it's a senior person who enables the situation and then everything goes sideways. Um, so a trick that I've always used is if, if you do like to drink and you're having that long event, fine drink. In the middle, put a club soda with a lime. Looks like you're still drinking. Not that you have to do that, but it may make it a little bit more socially easy for you. And ideally, I'd say two before you have another drink. The, the, again, the situations that I think of are drink, 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 <laughs> and then um, so I'll tell you, I'll just tell you one story because I think it just gives a, a, a sense. And this is, I would say this is what, I, what I'd call a positive story. Um, and thankfully most of them are um, wrapped in a, in a tough situation. So at another company far, far away, it's not here. Um, there was an intern who was out one summer with a bunch of people, you know, and I was at a carrier, so it was a bunch of underwriters, and then it was a broker party, and there were other companies there, so it was kind of an industry event. And um, like all industry events, it started probably at six, and it was probably like 10 o'clock, so people had been having appetizers, but they were also drinking. Um, about middle of the event, a senior person came up to the intern and just started talking with her and asking, you know, like what she, where she was working, what she did um, and said, Hey, I'd be, you know, I'd be glad to, you know, let me know if I can ever help you. Hey, here's my cell number. And, uh, and she gave him her cell number. Well, then about an hour later, she got a text from him. Hey, do you want to go out after the party? Um, she was like, uh, <laughs> so didn't say anything got another text and then he came up to her and was pretty aggressive about, hey, let's go out. Two of a, a, two other interns kind of interceded and said, you probably need to go away. Like we've got her, she's not interested, you need to go away. So I tell that story for two reasons. Um, number one, it's one of those stories. And again, nothing horrible happened, but she was uncomfortable with the situation. Her peers jumped in um, and really took leadership positions. So I would say you're all leaders. Number one is takeaway. Number one, number two, if you ever get in an uncomfortable situation and somebody doesn't jump in, find somebody and tell them situations never get better by ignoring them in my experience. Um, and number three, again, I don't think this person was a bad person per se, but had had a lot of drinks and probably, would have operated differently if not for that. So um, again, a story. Um, and I would just say, you know, I've had junior people who tried to keep up before with other folks and they made a mistake and that reflected on them. Even though again, in looking through the whole situation, I could say, okay, should have never happened. But again, it will happen. It's just the nature of the beast. I mean, if, you know, if all of you have been in school before, you can think of, and I could tell you stories when I was in school of the night that went sideways, um, but you have to take responsibility for yourself. So um, I will get off my soapbox now, but I, and the good thing is industry is full of amazing people. This may never happen to you, or it may happen multiple times to you. So just be aware of it. Again, what I would say is um, number one, with regard to brand, be patient. Um, you know, Rome isn't built in a day. Um, focus on the things that differentiate you. You know, when I think about my career, I, I mentioned early that I got into that situation that there'd never been an HR department. So I had to go and ask people questions and I had to build process where there wasn't process. And I managed a lot by walking around. That became my brand. I never defined it that way. It just kind of evolved. So don't worry about it if you don't have it all figured out, number one. Number two, as you start to figure it out, be protective of it. Um, ask for feedback and input from others. Um, that's going to be valuable. 
Um, you have to be open to feedback. Um, and, and that is an art in and of itself. Um, you know, I always told people, um, I looked at it as plus Delta, tell me what I need to do more of, tell me what I need to do less of. Um, but figure out that if you're not that comfortable with getting feedback, figure out kind of a model where you can get comfortable with it. And I mean, again, you, you can use that board of directors as kind of a sounding board to start there. Um, but feedback's how you're going to get better. Um, I think a neat thing with brand and a neat thing with the industry and society as a whole is, you know, we all live through the pandemic. Um, one of the things that I think really positive that came out of the pandemic was this notion of I can be my whole person at work. I don't need a work persona that's completely separate from my personal life. Now, if you're comfortable, if that's your comfort zone, you can still do that, by the way. But if you have passions outside of what you do from nine to five, you can bring them to work. Um, I, you know, I joked about being a Bills fan. My staff jokes that like I have 75 Bills helmets behind me. Um, that's one example. But then, you know, diversity and inclusion, I, you know, before it was cool, I was super passionate about that. You can bring all of that to work um, now. Um, you can bring it to LinkedIn. It can be part of your brand. So be, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, again, that's okay. But as you get more comfortable with it, there was once upon a time where people would be like, that's personal. Like, that's not something you bring here. That's not the case anymore. I think we can bring our whole selves to work. And again, I think that creates more alignment between your personal interests and your company cultures that you're in. Um, you know, and again, from a career management standpoint, I, the things that I would say are, as, you know, as you're building your career, think about the things that are most important to you and literally list them. So if you're going to make a job switch, you know, it's, it's kind of debits and credits, basically. What's the most important things to me that are non-negotiable? And is this opportunity, does it have alignment there? And again, you're not always going to have every box ticked. But if you're real deliberate about that, you won't make mistakes. Um, and, and you'll, you know, again, you'll find opportunities that reflect your interests and your passions. We talked about LinkedIn. We talked about social media as well. Um, but those are some of the things that I think about when I think about personal brand. Questions? All right. I'm going to open Riley, it up here. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So Riley's got her hand up. Go ahead, Riley. Um, so I know you've talked about it a little bit, but I was just wondering, like, for... Me personally, I know that I'm kind of pretty um, exploratory as far as my career is considered right now. So in terms of like figuring out your brand and kind of like what you want and what's important to you that you can bring into this industry or a similar industry, um, is there any advice that you could give for someone who's like fresh into trying to figure that out? Yeah. Um, you know, here's the great thing about the industry is I think the skill, all the skills that you're going to employ in any part of this industry are transferable. So I always tell people, and actually I was talking to one of our interns yesterday and he's like, I don't know, you know, originally I thought I wanted to start as a broker and then maybe underwriting, but now I'm interning in claims and I really like that. Like, you know, how do you figure out what you want to do? And it's like, well, you don't have to, number one, exactly. Um, some people enter this industry as a property underwriter and they're super successful and they basically stay in property their entire career as an example. And then I know people who've been a broker, a claims person, an underwriter, um, you know, went to an MGA um, because all of those skills are transferable. Um, so number one, don't stress about it. Number two, I think find if, if you're at a company and you're, you're in a position, I, I would say, the term that I've always used is find opportunities to organizationally navigate, which is really a fancy way to say, go outside your comfort zone and learn about what other parts of the company do. And just, you'll grab pieces of things and you'll build relationships that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, and that may inform you. So, you know, be intensely curious um, and that will open doors that otherwise wouldn't open. And I think, I said it early. I think curiosity is the one common thread through 
the whole industry, everyone that I know that's massively successful, whether they're a CFO, whether they're a broker, an underwriter, a claims person, an actuary, they're like insatiably curious. Uh, because again, we don't make anything. So it's the questions we ask, it's what we learn. That's how we grow. So I, that's a general answer to your question, but that's what I would do is, you know, if, if you, you know, if you're looking at opportunities, like a trainee program that was rotational would be fantastic, but some companies don't do that. So, you know, there's ways to navigate if you're placed in a department, again, to grab relationships and exposure outside of what you're doing, but don't ever feel like you're stuck because there is, there are too many positions and there's too much need for talent for anyone in this industry to be stuck. You, you'll be able to navigate to places where you currently aren't, if that's, again, where your passions lie. That's great. Thank you so much. No, thank you for the question. Anyone else? Oh, I have a question as well. Um, sure, Amanda. It's more specific to LinkedIn, I guess. Um, I work for a company that posts a lot on LinkedIn, and they encourage us to like and comment on everything. But I personally don't have I don't post, so I don't want like my whole feed to my, like the people that I follow only seeing like my company over and over again. So I don't right. know, how do I, I manage having, like, I don't want like, you know, my brand to be just the company I'm currently interning at, you know, how do I manage that? Yeah, I think, you know, again, look at it from the standpoint, it, it's to your comfort level, number one, but number two, going back to that whole person comment. So like, um, you know, it could be, like stuff that your university is posting or just like content that you're interested in. Um, so again, don't over stress about it. Um, but I would agree if all you're doing is liking your company's stuff, people are going to stop paying attention and it's going to, you kind of look like a homer a little bit. So figure out how to just bury it a little bit. Um, and the best way to do that is, you know, broaden your network, follow more companies, or more thought leaders, again, whatever, wherever your interests lie. And that'll lead to more variety in your feed that you can decide about, okay, do I want to like this? Do I want to leave it alone? And that's a way to vary it a bit. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. Sure, Caitlin. So I've talked with some people that say they prefer on LinkedIn only adding people that they can actually reference and would be able to say I have a connection with this person because they say how or reference how they think it makes them look stronger because they can be able to reach out to everyone they have on LinkedIn. Do you think you're at a disadvantage though by not adding everyone who adds you? Um, I, you know, I no, I don't think you're at a disadvantage. I think you kind of have to come up with where your comfort area is. Um, you know, again, and what I will say is I just don't blanket like people or follow people. I, I generally, if I'm reaching out to somebody, again, if somebody reaches out to me, I'm going to accept it because my view is again, unless it's like sketch, um, I'm, I think I'm advocating for the industry. I, you know, people joke, they're like, is there a student that you don't know yet? Um, and I'm like, well, it's a great opportunity to like, we need more talent in this industry. Like I, I, I appreciate the fact that somebody's reaching out and I want to help them. Some people don't aren't quite as giving in that sense. Um, so again, if if you reach out to somebody and they don't respond, just don't worry about it. But again, if you personalize a note and say, "Hey, I'm really interested in the insurance industry. It looks like you have a you know a pretty interesting career. I'd love to you know share ideas with you um, or ask you questions." personalizing those asks, I think people will respond to that generally. Um, you know, and I, I'm probably, I'm probably a little bit different in that since I'm in HR, when I ask someone to link with me, they're probably thinking, well, gosh, this guy might help me get a job someday. Um, so I probably get a little bit more um, credibility off the start, but I would, I would reach out to people broadly. And again, just be genuine and be yourself. And I think it's an industry, again, people don't know this outside our industry, but people are so giving. Um, and it's such a small, big industry 
that I think generally you'll find people will, will accept your requests. But again, you need to come up with when people ask you to, you know, to become part of their network, how you want to process that. Um, you know, um, but again, I would say generally speaking, it's funny, like last week I had somebody send me the dreaded, um, I'm having trouble in my personal life. Can you loan me $10,000 note over LinkedIn? And that hadn't happened in forever. And it's somebody that had been linked with and I'd spoken to before. So I almost wonder if her account, account was hacked or something. But that, I mean, I have like, they make fun of me. I have 18,000 connections. I can't think of too many, too many times where I've had like one that's been a sales call or something untoward. So go in being optimistic um, and I would accept requests if it's related to your interest and it's not, you know, a plumbing company, you know, from Michigan that you're like, that there's no sense in this. But if it's someone from the industry, reach out. And if they reach out to you, I'd accept it. And that, that same concept as the board of directors, make it reciprocal. I mean, there are people who have reached out to me for help and then I've turned around and done the same thing. Um, and and it's, it's an information resource and it's a network. So use it that way. All right. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'm not going to make you do this physically um, on this session. Um, but I wanted to encourage you just to kind of, as you think about brand, maybe a way to frame it a little bit. So what I do is find someone again, that you're comfortable with. And think of brand as your strengths and passions, your career goals, your experiences. And again, I go back to what I said earlier, bottom line is what makes you unique um, and turn it into kind of an elevator speech. And it won't be perfect at first, but it's a good way to kind of walk through the exercise. Does that make sense? Um, so some other stuff, I know we got a little bit of time that I, that I wanted just to cover a bit is, um, you know, I mentioned using me as a resource. I'll, I'll highlight a couple things, I, you know, early in your career, um, offers, career management, career development, um, relocating, all of that stuff can be really complicated. The things that I would encourage you to do, um, number one is, you're going to get tired of beating me beating this drum, use your network. But number two, um, ask the questions. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're still in university um, and you're considering offers, um, the first offer always isn't the best offer. I hate, I despise exploding offers. I despise when, when somebody comes to me, whether they have five years of experience or whether they're starting out and they're told, here's the offer, you have two, three, five days to accept it or it expires. Um, I understand why companies do that because like when we've had trainee classes, you know, I'm trying to fill all my spots and you can't wait for months. But there's a difference between even a couple weeks and three or five days. Um, so don't let other people's pressure pressure you into a decision you wouldn't, you know, that you don't want to make or that you're not ready to make. And ultimately, if somebody says to you, you have, you know, two days to accept something that could change your entire life and you're not comfortable with it, you're not comfortable with it. In, in this industry, you will get other offers. You, you know, some of you may be, I had an intern once who was literally considering five offers at once. Um, so the first offer isn't the best. Pressure isn't always a good thing um, in terms of an offer. And don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, I've had people before who've been, you know, they were relocating across the country and the offer didn't include any consideration for relocation. And I'm like, well, have you asked? Because it may just be that they're hoping you're going to take it and not have to give you some kind of relocation bonus. Or in some cases, they're just not thinking. But it, does, it never hurts to ask the question, which is different than making a demand. 
Um, and, you know, the other things I'd say are, um, you know, if companies aren't getting back to you, it's okay to follow up. But at some point, you know, it's kind of like a relationship. Um, at some point, if they're not getting back with you, move on. Because you probably don't want to work there anyway. If it's months and months and you've gotten radio silence and you've tried to follow up. Um, and uh, the third thing that I think of is don't be in a massive hurry from a career standpoint. You, you'll find the road will wind a little bit. Um, and there have been times absolutely when I knew I had to make a move and you may get to that point, but just because one thing changes doesn't mean that you should, you know, you should basically, um, gather all your stuff and go somewhere else. Um, I, I, I look at, you know, kind of career management as a balance between you can stay in the same company, your entire career, move around and be learning the whole time. You could stay at the same company the entire time and feel completely stuck and stagnant. You can make job switches, and I've seen a lot of people do this, particularly folks who have less than 10 years experience because the job market's been so ridiculous. And, and one of my former trainees, she's been at, I think, five companies since she was a trainee at the company where I hired her. And I know she's making a lot, a lot more money. But money isn't everything. I think she's really kind of damaged her brand a little bit and probably didn't learn as much. She's just she's just switched environments continually. Um, and I, I don't think that's how it's like. So you got to find your balance, um, but don't be in a hurry. I mean, in this industry, I will tell you, if, if you're new to it, this will be the only time you'll have to look for a job if you do it right and you do the networking that we talked about. Because every job that I've had since kind of my first couple jobs has come not off a job board, not from a recruiter, but from somebody that I knew who said, hey, I think you'd be good for this. And that's going to happen for all of you as well. Any questions about that? I know I didn't put that in slides, but I, I always like to cover that. All right, oh, well. Rebecca, anything else that you want me to cover? Yeah, well, I have a question that I can ask. So. Um, as they're out and about doing virtual networking, if they connect with someone on LinkedIn and they send them a message and the person does not reply, what is your advice on that? What to do with non-responses in LinkedIn messages? Yeah, I, I think a, a couple things. Number one, um, back to the be patient comment. I think um, sometimes... Sometimes people are not really great at LinkedIn replies. Like, so I will follow up again often because it, number one, if they have a big network or if they're often traveling, like I'm maniacal about it. I have LinkedIn on my phone and I get notifications, but that's, that's probably a personal problem to a degree. There are some people who literally use it as an app that they'll check in on once every couple of weeks. So don't presume that the person is ignoring you, number one. Number two, follow up. And number three, if, if you are connected with them, often you can look under their contact information and go a different medium. So some people have their cell phone posted on there. A lot, most will have their email. They'll also have their birthday too, by the way, if, if you don't know that. So try another medium to contact them. Um, but, you know, show some grace, I guess, is the biggest thing. And, and don't give up while balancing that without, you know, you can't stalk them or anything. Again, if they're not going to reply, they're not going to reply. Could, they could be at a point in their, you know, personal or professional life where they're just cup runneth over and that'll happen. But, you know, oftentimes when that's happened to me, I'll get a note from somebody they're like, oh my God, I didn't see this note. I am so sorry. Can I, you know, is there anything that I can do to help you? Um, you know, sometimes I think I had one from somebody like six months after I sent them something. I'm like, wow, you're really not checking this. It's okay <laughs> though. Um, but try and contact them through another means. Um, and, you know, if, if they don't contact you, who knows what's going on, you know, move on to another person who might be, you might be able to use as a resource for the same matter. Nice. Thank you. So there's a couple hands that are raised. Let's start with Riley. 
Um, since networking is so important, um, just in general, but especially in this uh, industry, because it's a relationship heavy industry, um, for people who aren't uh, easily social or a little bit more shy, would you have any like tips for how to manage networking and like small talk if that idea makes them a little bit nervous? Yeah. Um, so to, to some of my earlier slides, hopefully this will make people feel better. Um, I was horrible at this early in my career, totally uncomfortable with it, hated it, would not go to college career fairs because they just intimidated the heck out of me, by the way, college career fairs are whole, I mean, I just, I, they have a purpose, but if you're in that situation, I feel for you. It is like speed dating times a hundred. Um, but I wasn't good at it. So I think practice helps. So the things that I'd suggest, I always tell students this, um, with regard to job fairs, because I'm passionate about that. I think they're just really tough. Um, find a wingman. And, and, you know, I've seen it happen before where two students will come up to me, one will start talking to me, and then the other will feel more comfortable. You can do that in any kind of situation. You know, we see it like at insurance conferences all the time. Um, find what makes you more comfortable and ease into it. Number two, what I'd say is, again, I'm not paid by LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is a great way to test those networking skills that it's not so in your face. You're a little bit removed from it. Um, and, um, you know, for most of you at companies you're going to be at, there are going to be resources. Um, so like with our interns and trainees, we do Dale Carnegie training for presentation skills. Well, we also do kind of branded networking now for this exact reason, because they're different. I mean, I know people who are awesome presenters who you get them in a room of 20 people where they have to do small talk and they're terrified. So again, everyone has kind of their, their comfort zones, but you can build those skills. I think it starts by number one, acknowledging I need some help. You know, I'm not, it's not my natural state. And then number two, just take little baby steps outside of your comfort zone and you'll find you know, the way that I always tell people to feel comfortable about this stuff is there's one great truth in the universe. People like to talk about themselves. So the best way to do small talk is ask someone about themselves. They'll do all the talking and then you remember that piece. And then if you run into them again, that's the first thing you bring up. I always tell people when they're interviewing, like, look at the, if you're interviewing in an office, which I know doesn't happen anymore, it seems like, but even in a virtual office, you can see stuff like, Tony, why, the, why do you have the gong behind you? Um, find something to anchor to and use that as your small talk. And people like to talk about themselves. Um, so do that. And, and, and I think that helps. And you just need to acknowledge that it's not, you know, again, Rome's not built in a day. So you're not going to turn into, um, you know, somebody who's commanding the whole room, but you can get there. I mean, it, it, it's totally, you just baby step it. Fantastic. Great question. Tiffany, go for it. And um, so my name is Tiffany Lee. I just graduated from UGA. And earlier you were talking about how there was a woman who hopped around a lot. And so speaking of maybe staying with a company and being able to get a very fulfilling experience, can you talk about how being involved within the company, like through employee resource groups or committees or outside a company, like with rooms chapters can affect your personal brand and being promoted? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's, and by the way, go dogs. Um, I, I think that's a, a great way. And then when I talk about organizational navigation and kind of whole person, I think that's, you're, you're kind of referencing that a little bit. So I would say there's the job. So it's, it's what you're doing. And, you know, probably initially, it's probably a pretty self-contained group. Then there's things like employee resource groups, or even, you know, again, coming out of the pandemic, I think we're starting to get back to things like, you know, people will, um, you know, go out and there might be a softball team or, you know, wherever your interests are. Um, again, they're, they're gamma chapters all over the place. Um, they're, they're young risk professional meetings. There's APIW, but find opportunities to get outside of those four walls that you're operating in, in your job, both in the company and outside the company. 
And I think inside the company, what that will provide you with is, again, a broader network, um, more information about, again, if you feel stuck in your department, well, I learned more about this other department now. Let me investigate whether there are opportunities there. Or, you know, and, and I think the nature of work now, too, is there are so many working groups. So you have your job, but you, you might have the opportunity to participate on a project or on an employee resource group. Like at Westfield, the, the employee resource groups, I mean, employees do everything with that. They do the programming, and that's a great opportunity to both build skills, build network, and get some variety. So I think that's a great suggestion. You know, and I think the things that I would say are, I'll never begrudge people moving. And I think there's two primary reasons why I definitely consider a move. One would be if the culture is, con and, and it's gotta be over a long period of time because cultures ebb and flow. But if the culture becomes contrary to kind of my personal values and interests, yeah, I need to consider a move. The second is if I don't have a good manager and I don't have any other options to fix that management situation, either it's not getting better after trying or, you know, you, you know, you're stuck. That's when you consider make, you know, you definitely need to make a move. Now there are going to be other opportunities that present themselves that are great from a career standpoint. I have a good friend. She's at a, had a really good job in the industry. Um, but she got approached about this other this distribution job that would build on her skills. She was happy where she was, but that was great for her career development to make that move. That will happen. But what I what I do get anxious about is when I particularly people early in their career, it's like, I need more money or I want to move to this city because I think it would be cool or um, I just feel like I could, you know, I could do more somewhere, but I haven't asked at my existing place. Those kind of moves I get anxious about because when is it going to be enough? You, you know, the, the industry is growing so quickly. You're going to have plenty of opportunities if you're at a good company. If you're not waiting, you know, and you're making a move every year to two years, I just think that ultimately will damage your brand, even if you feel like you're getting somewhere faster. It's going to slow you down on the other end. Thank you. That was a really good question. Yeah, thank you for that advice. And we have uh, Hannah as well. Go ahead, Hannah. Um, when you're starting your like career or you're about to start your career, where should you start like searching for opportunities? Like which job sites or like how would you approach that if like, you already said that, you know, you don't like job fairs. So like what, what is the more, I don't know, approachable option? Yeah. No. And I, I, I do pick on job fairs, but I'm not dismissing. I mean, they have value. I just think it's a tough situation for all of you. But what I would say is again, not paid by them. LinkedIn, most companies have realized LinkedIn is a very efficient way to do postings, but also, you know, I'm a big fan of not being passive in your job search. So go, go find the opportunities. So LinkedIn is one way. And again, it's a good aggregator site. And there are lots of sites like that. Um, but target companies that you have interest in um, and, you know, go to their website. Number one, learn about what the companies do, because I think that's a way to differentiate yourself. I have candidates with 25 years experience. I will go through a two hour interview with them. They will not ask a single question. I'm done. Um, curiosity, again, is a big one, but just showing that you've invested the time to understand a little bit and you don't have to do a lot, all that information is at your fingertips. So do a little bit of research, go to the companies direct. And if you have companies that you're interested in, don't like if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I saw your Westfield specialty stuff. Do you have any roles? I'm going to call that person back because it doesn't happen that often. Um, so, you know, number one, use your network. Number two, again, LinkedIn is a good resource, but go to the company sites and um, ask your peers, your professors, and or people in your network, like, where should I be looking? Like, you know, I'll, I'll throw a couple things out there. Out Outside of our company, someplace that I would always tell people to look, Markel's a great company. Never worked for them. Have all the respect in the world for them. 
on the brokerage side, you know, Amwins is a great company. I, I, I could list, there are more great companies than other companies, but again, re reach out to people and ask for their input. Um, and, you know, Spencer and the other resources and associations that you guys have access to are great ways to find out more about those companies. Thank you. Of course, right. appreciate the question. Fantastic. So with that, we are at time for this webinar. So Tony, thank you so much for hanging out with us here for an hour My and getting honor. to know these amazing students from across the country um, and Canada. We have a couple participants dialing in from I Canada. I grew up in as Buffalo, well. so I spent a lot of time in Canada. Thank there you. you thank all of you. Seriously, reach out. Use me as a resource. Tandaka, a pleasure as always. Thank mm -hmm. Really honored to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So for the students, as you know, we host these sessions on a weekly basis during the summer. So next week's session is going to be on Thursday, July 6th from 1 to 2 Eastern. Our presenting company will be Gallagher, and we're going to learn how to improve your communication skills in the workplace. So thank you again for your time, and we will catch you next week. Have a good one. Bye now. Bye.